So, lecture 2.4, we're going to actually put together a lot of the pieces that we've been doing. So we've been doing a lot of examples of, of linear graphs, right? And we've talked about their sign conventions. We've talked about you know, like what they represent, the system structure, and, and their uh, interconnection laws now. And now we're going to just sort of give a, a sort of overview, summary, conclusion for linear graph modeling. So coming up with a linear graph uh, uh, systematically when you approach a problem, when you approach a physical system and you want to model it. So we'll do that, and it's kind of a, summarizing a lot of stuff that we've already talked about, but it, it's good to ha have it sort of in one place, I think. And we'll do the same thing in the next chapter. The next chapter is on state space modeling. So we have our linear graph model that we're developing in this chapter, and then the next chapter we'll develop the state space model, which is a mathematical model instead of graphical model. But it's going to be based on this graphical model. We're going to use the linear graphs to construct the, the state space mathematical model. And there will be a similar procedure for constructing the mathematical model, and that's kind of what we're building toward. And, the, and when, when we finally get that, maybe Wednesday, <laughs> I was hoping for Wednesday, we'll see, maybe Wednesday, uh, then we'll be ready to do some really cool problems. Um, yeah. So, I cannot wait. I am really looking forward to that. So, systematic linear graph modeling. A system graph is what we've been constructing uh, already. So it's a representation of a physical system as a set of interconnected linear graph elements. The construction of a system graph requires a number of engineering decisions. In general, we can use the following procedure. The first three of these are the sort of most difficult in terms of interpretation, and this is where the AIs are going to really struggle for a while still, so we still got the edge right here. Okay. So, step one, define the system boundary and analyze the physical system to determine the essential features that must be included in the model. Especially, what are the inputs, what are the outputs? So, when we talk about outputs, we're thinking, what are the variables of interest to us? Uh, energy domain, see? So, is it a translational mechanical system, a rotational mechanical system, electronics, uh, some uh, uh, intermixing of those? And what are the key elements? Okay, so if it's something that has like a motor in it, that's pretty obviously a key element. There are other elements that are just going to be really key elements. It's good to identify those really early on. And usually they're pretty obvious. Um, so two, form a schematic model of the physical system and assign schematic signs according to the sign convention of lecture two, two, which we went through in detail the, the different sign conventions. Step three is to determine the necessary lumped parameter elements representing the system's energy sources, the system's energy storage. So sources are when energy comes from outside the system, right? S storage is when we store that energy somewhere in the system, like in a capacitor or in kinetic energy of a mass or something like that. Um, and then energy dissipation. Typically, energy dissipates into heat, right? That's sort of quintessential uh, energy dissipation. Uh, okay, and then after we've done that, we identify the across variables that define the linear graph nodes and draw a set of nodes, okay? So cross variables meaning the voltage or the velocity in a mechanical system or angular velocity in a, in a rotational system. And finally, assign, uh, 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 so determine the appropriate nodes for each lumped element that we developed in step three and include each element in the graph. So the lumped elements, meaning what, you know, the mass or the capacitance or the um, um, maybe the source elements, like a force source, wherever those go, connect them up to the correct nodes. And then finally, we assign the signs on the, the uh, branch elements, the, the lumped elements, according to the sign convention. So the sign convention includes one for the, the schematic and then also for the linear graph, although we focus on the linear graph. Okay, so another sort of key note here is that, is that when we 
when we develop these um, these models, a lot of times we don't know what the parameter is very well. Uh, for certain systems, we do. Like for the capacitance, maybe we have a pretty good value that's measured or a value that's like the, the rated value for that component. Um, uh, or, or maybe uh, a resistor, we know pretty well what the resistance is. Um, but there's always variation in every part. And like a 10 kilo ohm resistor is, you know, is plus or minus, depending on the resistor, 5%, 10% could be. So you have some error there. So you, you have, uh, uh, even in systems that we know pretty well, often it's good to do some measurements to make sure that you have the correct parameters in your model. Otherwise, you're not going to be very good with your predictions. Um, and for mechanical systems, we know things like mass and spring constant usually fairly well. Uh, but the damping coefficient is relatively difficult to determine unless you do experiments. So doing an experiment to determine the damping coefficient is probably the, the mechanical system modeling um, uh, most important experiment to do. It's usually the, the parameter you know the least about. OK. Um, so the first three steps, yeah, are the hardest. I already talked about that. So let's do some examples. And we've already been constructing these, so I think we're going to be able to breeze through these pretty pretty quickly. So let's do a translational mechanical system first, really simple one. Um, say we had a physical system that was some cantilevered beam that has uh, some weight that's relatively concentrated towards the end. We could perhaps come up with a simple schematic for it and say, okay, this is like a mass, uh, a, a lumped parameter mass that um, is a point mass, and it's connected to a spring that is, be, is modeling the, the, the uh, elasticity of the beam, right? So the beam would, would, if you jumped on the end of the beam, it would vibrate up and down, and that would be like a little bit like a spring. If you jumped on the spring, it would go up and down. Okay, so, uh, and then there's a force source. We're saying that we're applying some force to the mass of the end. Um, so we could also uh, apply a, a force source here. And we drew our coordinate arrows to be down, which happens to be in the direction of the force source. So that's convenient, right? That's what we like. So we want to draw a linear graph. We always start out with ground, right? That's just always our, our good, good go-to. Gives us started. It makes us feel like we know what we're doing. Uh, so we draw the ground node. And then we have to ask ourselves, what other across variables? Oh, so what, are the, what is the across variable in this system? First of all, what is the across variable? Velocity. So the velocity of the across variable. And so we need to determine for the nodes where the distinct velocities are in the system. So which other distinct velocities do we have? The mass. The mass has a distinct velocity, different than ground, right? So let's go ahead and draw that one in. Whenever I identify a mass uh, node, I immediately draw it to ground. Remember, the dashing is to remind us that it's a sort of virtual connection to ground. And I also draw the arrow towards ground because it's always directed towards ground. So that one's a nice one to start us out with. Um, are there any other nodes in this one? Or is that it? That's it, right? Yeah. So we just have the mass. Uh, the mass node up here uh, is where the force source is applied, right? The force source is applied. And we have to determine the direction of the force source arrow. So do you remember if you have a through variable source, which is a force, so a force source in the mechanical translational energy domain, um, if you have a translational uh, uh, system with a, with a force source, and it's in the direction, the source arrow is in the direction of the coordinate arrow, which direction do you draw the arrow here? 
Toward, yeah, that's right. So towards the, the node of application, right? Towards the node where, where the, the force is being applied, which is on the mass node. Very good. And we have one more element, right? So between which nodes should I draw the spring? Mass node and ground. Yeah, there's really only two nodes. So <laughs> we definitely had to do this. And it is, that's true, right? I mean, this is a good, this is good to check. The mass, it connects one end of the spring, and then the ground connects the other end of the spring. So it's good. If that wasn't the case, then we probably missed a node, right? So, okay, so we've got this, and we've got to determine the arrow. That's the last thing we need to do for this. Which direction does the arrow go? It goes, it goes down, and it, it, what it is is it's in the direction of the coordinate arrow. So from the mass node to the ground node, so from the mass node to the ground node. So that is our linear graph for the mechanical system. Since I like keeping you guys late, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna, we're going to do these other two because they're actually pretty easy. It'll be another five minutes and we'll be out of here. So I apologize if anybody's really excited about lunch. You're just getting bonus material right here. This is the encore. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so. <laughs> So we need, uh, so we drew our, our ground node, right? And we need to determine which other distinct across, variable, uh, across variables there are. So across variable is the angular velocity for a rotational mechanical system, right? And we're, mo we're modeling this motor as being a velocity source that's being uh, uh, applied to this shaft, okay? So that's what this omega is, is a, is a, is a velocity source applied to the shaft. And this shaft definitely has a, an angular velocity of its own, right? So I drew, I labeled it A up on the diagram, and we can label it A here just to give us a, a reference. So there's A. And then it goes through the drag cup, and it comes out on the other side. There's a flywheel and a shaft that's connected to a bearing. This I don't mean to be confusing with this. I was just uh, defining our positive our positive uh, angular velocity is to the right here. Was, this is the coordinate arrow. And uh, I included an arrow over here, but it actually maybe looks confusing because it looks a little bit like a source. It's not a source. Um, it's just labeling it as omega j, and which is towards the right. So we have ourselves uh, another angular velocity. The flywheel is different than the shaft at A, right? So the flywheel and its shaft, we assume, is all at the same angular velocities. We don't show any elements in between. So we can assume that everything else over here is at B. Are there any other angular velocities here? J. So we're going to say that J actually is the same as B. And so we could, we could immediately write, draw J here towards ground um, because it has the same angular velocity as the shaft here at B. Without some, some uh, uh, in this, this is sort of a schematic, we would draw in something in between there if we didn't want to assume that. So we assume it's a short shaft. It's not super long and flexible. So we have uh, A and B and our ground. So we already drew our J in. Let's draw in our velocity source, which we connect from ground to the place that it's applied, omega s. And omega s is drawn, if you follow the arrow around the shaft, it's right, correct? Which in the video is left, but that, that way, right. And uh, the coordinate arrow is also pointed right. Therefore, our cross variable source is pointed toward ground, right? Away from the node of application. Okay. And then uh, we have between that, so there's no mass or, or inertia associated with shaft A. It must just be relatively small uh, inertia. So we can connect then from A over to B through the drag cup, right? Which is B2. 
the arrow is going to be from left to right, correct? In the, in the direction of the coordinate arrow. So coordinate arrow points from left to right. Node A is left of node B, so we go from left to right. The flywheel we've already got. There's only one more element, that's B1, right? The bearing. The bearing is always, or virtually always, going to connect to ground, right? It always connects to the chassis. And we always draw those to ground for the arrow. So there's B1. Okay, any questions on that one? All that's left is the electronics one now. Okay, so for the system shown, develop a linear graph model. The schematic for an electronic system, of course, is practically a linear graph. It's just a circuit diagram. So we're like ready to go here on our, on our uh, linear graph. So let's draw it in. It's going to have more elements than some of the other ones, but it is uh, pretty easy to interpret. So nodes A, B, C, and D are the, are the four nodes that we have in this graph, right? So this is D. Our ground node is D. All of this becomes one node. And then we have our uh, uh, nodes A, B, and C. And all we need to do is connect the dots, right? So uh, the voltage source, Vs, connects from ground up to node A, right? And it drops plus or minus down. So we have to draw that down, Vs. It is an across variable source also, um, but in the electronics world, it's just pretty easy just to read. Just draw it in the direction of the voltage drop, always in the direction of the voltage drop. OK, and then we've got uh, uh, one element that connects nodes A and B. What is that element? L1. L1. And I drew uh, a coordinate arrow on the schematic. So remember, for electronic systems, we do that, right? Every, everywhere on the, uh, we draw it in some direction. And it's, and it's arbitrary, right? Passive elements. I drew it to the right. Let's just draw it to the right. There's no reason to stray from it. Um, and then we go from B to C with, what, what one's that? L2. OK. Now, uh, we'll go back to B here and connect it through C to ground, right? C1 to ground. Note that although the capacitor is an A-type energy storage element, we don't typically dash that one because a capacitor doesn't have to connect to ground. Okay, The other A-types, the mass element and the moment of inertia element, they have to connect to ground. Um, and that's an, a virtual connection. This is a real connection to ground, but a capacitor doesn't have to connect to ground. Although it does in both of these cases, so that's not helping me out in my description. <laughs> so this is C2, right? From C to D, from, from C to the ground. And then finally, we have RL, which comes out up here. And that's that. So it's almost just like you almost don't have to draw the linear graph <laughs> if you have the circuit diagram. It's practically the same thing, right? But it is a little bit nicer in terms of, of uh, recognizing what's parallel and what's in series. And yeah, so. All right, so we will reconvene on Wednesday. Hope you guys have a nice lunch. <laughs>